Welcome to another episode of Just More Fix. This is James. With me in this episode is Lacey. Hey. You can find us online at justmorefix.com or on Twitter at Just More Fix. If you like us, you can support us at Patreon and you can give us a rating and review at iTunes or wherever you find us at. In this episode, we're going to talk about putting the characters in the deep end. And now, it's time to get our gaming fix. Willie D. Nelson from All Things Good and Nerdy, a pop culture podcast, part of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other tantalizingly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to another episode of Just More Fix. A couple quick announcements before we get things going again. We will be having another Indie RPG Day at uh, Game on South 7th and Terre Haute on July 14th from 12 to 4. And I am going to be running Itris B, so it's going to be a good time. I'm running the number 13, so we'll see how that goes. And hopefully it will be some surreal noir awesome, and it will be terrible and bad in a noir kind of way. And there will be cards. Oh, yeah, and there's cards because it's got a really cool <laughs> resolution system and a really good way to add a certain element of surrealism that isn't sort of super forced. It's kind of an interesting way to do it. Um, you can still hold your dice sack if you want. Well, it <laughs> yeah. if it makes you feel better. True story. True story. So if you like surreal games or surrealism in general, uh, Itris B is definitely worth a look. It, it's made by um, a company out of, uh, I think, Finland or Sweden. I can't remember which, which of the two, but it's a really, really interesting <laughs> setting and really cool game. So it's worth a look at. Second announcement is... Our second zine is in full swing production, and uh, I, con- or I commissioned the artwork a couple weeks ago, so waiting for the new uh, preview sketches to come in for the artwork that's going to be in that, and I'll be posting those up on our Patreon as soon as we get those, and should be having a couple more playtests of it, and it's looking pretty good. We had a good time uh, with our first playtest, and it turned out pretty good. So if you are interested in some more sort of OSR, DIY, D&D terribleness to drop on your players... Uh, you can support us at Patreon and get access to um, our newest zine coming out called Hastings Party, which is just another terrible thing to drop on your players with winter spirits and some awful like Mardi Gras cannibal terribleness because I'm a terrible human being. So, <laughs> But it's been a lot of fun and uh, hopefully you guys check it out and you can find that at uh, just more or patreon.com slash just more fix. In addition to that, we have an itch.io store now, like so many other small publishers do. So you can go to justmorefix.itch.io and check things out there. And as it stands right now, it looks like we're going to release our zines there probably like um, three months after they've been on our Patreon. And all of our patrons have had a chance to sort of uh, get them out and enjoy them and check them out. So big thanks to everyone that supports us there uh, at Patreon for helping us pay for the artwork and make this whole thing an actual thing because it's been really fun and kind of terrifying but mostly awesome to be able to do them so all right so today we're going to talk about uh i don't know i kind of titled this one putting the characters in the deep end but it's something that i like to do in most of my games um and this applies to both D D and vampire and basically most of the games that i run and just to set this up what i'm talking about is sort of like when you teach someone to swim and you just throw them in the deep end of the pool and see how it goes, right? Mm-hmm. We have a hot springs game, right? And you guys are all first. You may have heard about it. <laughs> yeah, first level characters. And hot springs is terribly deadly. And there's loads of stuff that can kill you. And there's it's, loads of stuff of poisonous. Of all, let me stop you there. It's awesomely deadly. Yeah, it is. It's not terrible. <laughs> well, no. Yeah, then that terrible and that like that good kind of awesome. terrible. It's yeah. awesomely, awe inspiringly deadly. All right. It's the perfect word. Fair enough. <laughs> awesome. So, and I do that same thing with when I run vampire games. So I build a city, and obviously, if you're playing an old of darkness game, you're never the biggest fish because that's kind of the premise of the entire game. And then it's sort of like see what you can do and what trouble you can kind of get into, and enemies you can make, and frenemies and allies and whatever, and see what happens. So Night Witches is a perfect example of this because this is definitely the deep end of the pool, right? Like the high end of the sky, maybe might be a better. It's a terrible analogy, but like, you know, it is, things are definitely not on your side. You're definitely overwhelmed. The odds are against you, all that kind of stuff, right? So, so you play in all of these games, and have you noticed the trend between each of them uh-huh. in terms of being like against I enjoy uncer- them all. Done. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> so, but like, 
do you notice the trend? I'm feeling like the least helpful human alive today. <laughs> Have you noticed the trend of how they're all kind of broadly speaking structured the same way in that you're you're all largely over like against the odds? I'm always the hero of my own story, and so I always feel like there's the possibility that I'm going to f- defeat the odds. <laughs> well, I feel like that's the sort of the premise of why we're playing the games, right. right? Yeah. Let's set Night Witches and like World of Darkness aside, right? Because those are – there's not really a way to balance a vampire game, right? Because there, it, it works on so many different <laughs> levels. You know what I'm saying, right? But it, but the Hot Springs game is more of a and d style game, right? And – that game, in that game, I've intentionally made it sort of like unbalanced against you. And so part of that was to put you guys into a situation where you had to weigh your options and like puzzle things out so you couldn't just sort of charge right in and, you know, go death, murder and mayhem right away. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's why I like harder challenges because you're forced to come at them intelligently. <laughs> Like some, it's nice to have smaller ones too, because sometimes you just like to like go in and chop things up. Right, all right, right. But sometimes, you know, you want to like go in there with precision and a plan and a little bit of cleverness. <laughs> I guess kind of what I'm the the main hurdle for doing this, I feel like, is always letting the players know that the odds are definitely against them, right? But not doing it in such a way to where they feel like they're paralyzed and can't do anything. Does that make sense? I think it would be hard to, to make it so severe that they'd feel like they're paralyzed and they couldn't do anything. I think that arises just out of not having enough details. Because like the games I run, it's a foregone conclusion usually what's going to happen. And it doesn't take the fun away from it. I can tell you at the beginning, like, nobody is getting out of this alive. In ca- like in a dread situation. Yeah. Or in Bluebeard's Bride, like, mm-hmm. really, there are no happy endings in this game. Right. Something terrible is going to befall you. <laughs> we know this already. Let's find out what happens. <laughs> right on. Well, you mentioned maybe it's that they don't have the players may not have enough details. So, do you feel like that's incumbent on the game master to sort of poke at them to or not poke at them to prod them to question things and try and investigate and get more information, or is that on the GM to sort of like do that through exposition or show them through different smaller encounters or whatever? Both. I I just I find befuddlement to be incredibly frustrating in a game. It's the only thing I don't enjoy in a game. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, yeah, I don't know if your players don't know what to do, then you need to present them with something appealing to do or drop them a clue about what they're supposed to be doing. Maybe not everybody's like that. I guess some people like sandbox games and they're just like, you didn't give me anything to do, so I'm going to go over here and play with this thing. But that's not me. Like, I need an assignment. If I'm not <laughs> sure what I'm supposed to be doing, I get angry. <laughs> well, I think in the cases of hot, in the case of Hot Springs, that that game, at least in, at our table, has been very sandbox like. But it's a very small sand because you're stuck on this island, right? And it's mm-hmm. not a very big one. And every hex is just crammed full of stuff and encounters and things to investigate and do, right? So even if I didn't give you things to do, I feel like automatically you're going to stumble into something no matter what. Right. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out here is in in the – sticking with the Hot Springs uh, as, a, as a case, right? Like – there's several competing factions on the island, right? Mm-hmm. All of which are more powerful than the characters. Mm-hmm. And then there are several other sort of, I don't know, neutral isn't the right word, but creatures and encounters that aren't involved with the larger sort of like political agenda that's happening on the island, right? And even those encounters are stacked against you. Like I'm thinking of the uh, the carpet, the ghost carpet tree thing mm-hmm. and stuff. And so – I guess what I'm trying to figure out is all these encounters that you guys have had, it's been a, kind of in uh, interesting to me in that you haven't uh, kind of gone at them combat right away. And I'm wondering, like, why is that? Is it just because you know you're I'm, underpowered or? Yeah, I'm not a powerful character. That's, that, that is not my forte. Mm-hmm. I couldn't even tell you right now what weapons I possess. <laughs> Wait, yes, I can. It's bombs. Bombs, yeah. Do you know what bombs require? Planning. <laughs> At yeah. least a little. 
Right. They are not a run into combat with it. You know, they're not a have it at the ready type thing. True, true. <laughs> and in that game, there's six players and we have a pretty diverse cast of of um, classes and that kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily a specialized party. It's pretty, pretty broad because of the number of players that we have. It's really almost exactly like approaching World of Darkness playing a Tremere. Oh, with your character? Right. Yeah, there's nothing that I can do right now that is going to affect you. I could I could decimate your world in the long run, <laughs> but I need to have like a well thought out game right. plan. Yeah, there, yeah, there are no willy nilly spur of the moment decisions. Although there's some just out of natural dangerous right. curiosity, but that and trying to find a way to survive. Not combat, not dangerous combat decisions. <laughs> right. And I will say that some of this has also been on my end, and that at least on the encounter tables for that specific game, and it's something that I plan to take into any other game that I have is that when you roll the encounters, first you roll sort of like what kind of encounter it is and then what they're doing, right? And what the creature or it might be an intelligent sort of entity or something, most of those don't involve combat immediately. Most of them involve them doing something else and you sort of stumble into this situation. Mm -hmm. And I have let you, or not, not just you, but the entire table sort of dictate how they wanted to go about that. Like, how do you approach this situation? Because if you don't come at it host with, you know, not I mean, like, obviously, you're on a desert island, deserted island with hostile everything. So having your weapons out isn't necessarily automatically a problem. But there's a certain amount of, like, caution that you approach these encounters with and not going right to attacking them and trying to kill them. And I think that's something that would apply in any game, whether it's. You know, Dragonlance or Forgotten Realms or Ravenloft or any of it, right? Doesn't matter where it's at. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I feel like you're just giving too much credit to the fact that we're trying to find another way to approach it. Like, it, it's really just insurmountable. So you're forced to find another way to get around it. Okay. So do you got, do you feel like, has that felt sort of like railroady to you then? Like, you're f like, no, the, because the setting makes it very real. If you were to drop a scientist in the jungle. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. Don't expect them to slay any silverback gorillas. I don't even know if those live in the jungle. but <laughs> They do. They do, in fact. There you go. Panthers also not going to be killing any panthers. Like, yeah. I mean. <laughs> I don't disagree. And a lot of these creatures are not something that. Like, it's not railroading to think that I am not going to be able to kill a dragon in Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Like, I guess we're at when... Uh... In fact, I would say it would be railroading to let your players kill a dragon. Because think about all the <laughs> fantasy literature you've ever read, right. all the movies you've ever watched. Where did you see a dragon that was such a pansy that he was actually able to be killed? One... Dragon heart, and it was like, like <laughs> he like let it happen practically. I mean, well, I think with two pieces of <laughs> they shared a heart. <laughs> two pieces of media that have come out recently, it's really shown what dragons are capable of. So, like smog, right? In right. whichever version of a Hobbit that was, whichever was it, the third one that came out, whatever it is, it was definitely in the Hobbit and not the Lord of the Rings. No, I know, yeah, but whichever <laughs> Hobbit movie it was, the, I think it was the Desolation, Desolation of, of Smog. That would make sense, yeah. Uh, uh, big brain. Anyway, but when he comes soaring through there and you see how big he is and he's like laying down the fire and all the destruction, you realize how much of a, you know, incredibly dangerous and powerful this dragon is. And then in Game of Thrones. I feel like they were a little willy nilly with the destruction. Like, I'll give him the first one by surprise. The second one was nonsense. Like, I mean. The second dragon dying. Oh, yeah, Like, yeah. the first one, you're like, okay, so you just created this um, ballista that we'd never seen before. Oh, so yeah, I'll yeah. give it to you. We didn't see that coming. Didn't know that was a thing. You got us on cleverness on that one, right? right? The second time, though, that was just Well, I'm also just like talking you're in about... ships that are flammable. Also, the reload time on those, <laughs> way, way yeah. bogus. Like, that whole scene was nonsense. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm more talking about though the destruction of King's Landing and everything that happens because of that. I guess spoiler alert. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, it's been out for a month now, something like that. Anyway, but you really see the destructive power of a dragon, right? right. Especially like to sort of face napalm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to to common people and not like hardened, grizzled veteran soldiers or whatever, you know. And even them, though, they're getting burned alive and and smoked, you know. 
So I see what you're saying, but I think that part of the like D and D ethos is that we go find dungeons and we go attack dragons in holes where they're not as combat effective because, well, trying to fight the air force with a bow and arrow is not good. <laughs> you know, he... breath weapon. No, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. <laughs> but if you consider that breath weapon, they're also supposed flies, to be highly intelligent. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I this is something I've always, a problem that I've always had with D and D is that there is lots of dungeons and not many dragons that you encounter, which I think is good in some ways because I feel like this should be kind of rare. But it's like, okay, so we're second level characters in this dungeon and we encounter like this wormling that we're going to kill because, you know, and it's, it'll be dangerous and whatever, but we'll probably survive. Well, how many wormlings are there that are just like wandering around willy nilly, not doing, you know, with no. All kinds. <laughs> I'm like, what? Apparently. this is crazy. Yeah. You know, like the worst, you know, I get the reptiles or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but it just seems kind of silly. And then you add on top of that, as soon as it can fly, like. I don't know, fight a goose. It's terrible. <laughs> you know, it can fly, you know, and it doesn't even have a breath weapon. It doesn't have to fly. Like, I am small and fleshy, and am I a warrior? No, by no means. But if you put me next to something even way less scary than a dragon, let's call it a Komodo dragon. <laughs> Still gonna lose. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. It's just, I don't, I really wonder if it's sort of like the mechanics of it, because we're using... Like uh, something very similar to like BX or LOTFP when we play that game. And it changes things a lot because while you guys are fourth level, you're still not heavy hitters by any stretch of the means. So encounters are still very, very dangerous and deadly. And in a more traditional D&D game, at fourth level, you're starting to sort of hit your stride for when you can start to, you're not like a powerhouse, but you're definitely not. Easily killable. Exactly. So I guess, I, I don't know, it's what I was trying to figure out because I know a lot of people that play D&D, that's what they want, right? And if that's the case, if that's what your table wants, then maybe this isn't the right approach. Well, it's like the expectation, especially even more so recently, that you're going to sit down and play D&D and this is going to be your character for the next five years of your actual life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to play it till epic dome. I just... Um, and, and that seems boring to me. Like, I, I enjoy having characters that go for a long time. Generally speaking, though, it's not D&D characters. D&D characters don't compel me. Maybe any character compels me enough to play it for more than, like, may, I, think, I feel like three years is probably my max. I don't know. Like, I'm enjoying Night Witches right now, but if it went on for a whole nother year, I'd be like, okay, am I, am I dying yet? Right. Am I... Well, that's a setting thing. That's Surely a little different. Surely sometime soon. But, but you know, for any game, any game at all, LARP, any other vampire game, no. I'm just tired of this character. Really? Yes. Mm. I, I play games so I can live a thousand different lives. Right. Don't limit me to this one. Hurry up and kill me already, man, so I can... <laughs> I guess that's kind of a wild thing for somebody to like to make characters that much. I, I enjoy playing characters. <laughs> it's like the exact opposite process. of what you like to do. Like, I don't want to play this game. Why? Because I don't make a character right now. Oh. <laughs> well, if you gave me one that was And then done, you're like, though, okay, kill me. It. Yeah, just kill this character so I can play another one. Like, what? Not like in one session, but I mean like a 10 count. Like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so it's like a boxing match, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 10 rounds and we're done. So, um... Our next night, which is session. I can't believe I'm not dead already. It will be the tenth, <laughs> the tenth game session. <laughs> I mean, I may have died in this last episode. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert: still alive. <laughs> it's really a miracle that news. There's not yeah, a lot of is. marks left. Anyways, mm -mm. that's neither here nor there. <laughs> you talk about setting up expectations, right? And I feel like in a world of darkness or vampire sense, right? That already is the expectation. When you sit down to that game, you know, even if I make a prince and I'm the prince of whatever it is, Indianapolis or wherever, Chicago, whatever it is, there's still an Archon and there's still a Justicar and there's still a Council of Seven and there's still and, 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 and right? all kinds of Methuselahs. Right. <laughs> so you're never going to be the biggest fish, right? And generally speaking, you almost never want to go like all in in any situation in vampire because you've got to have sort of like the ace in the hole no matter what the whether it's a social combat or a mental or a physical situation right but that's that's sort of like the expectation you have set up when you come to play vampire right what i just was thinking like what if you can bind vampire with like D, &D but it wouldn't be like dark ages right so just like at any point 
an epic level D and D character would just like get bored with your fifth level character and just be like, and I dispatch you now. <laughs> well, like the <laughs> and there would be nothing you could do about there it. There was a D20 World of Darkness by Monty Cook that was like you're the, I think the the clans were classes. Mm-hmm. So you're like I'm a fourth level Bruja. It was I was not for me. No, I'm just actually picturing D and D characters, and at some point, like a twenty fifth level fighter would be like you're annoying me fifth level fighter oh and he would just really just kill, kill you, you. <laughs> and that would be it like i need a new It'd be like D, but with this system on top of it as well <laughs> this is a terrible idea true story do you see what i'm what i'm kind of getting at with because world of darkness really runs and plays a lot differently than D. okay but what about a different system that isn't either of those two systems what about dogs in the vineyard what about Mothership or Blades in the Dark or? So I feel like I feel like Mothership relies on a lot of the same style of gaming as like the DIY BX kind of stuff does because it's got a very old school feel to it. So I feel like you go into that one already underpowered, right? And it's it's that kind of that alien feel, right? Where. Plus you're in space. Yeah, if I get shot and sucked out into the vacuum of space, that's it. That's it. Cool. You know, and I, I make another uh, marine or whatever, right? So I feel like that one you got to kind of set aside in the same way because it's the same arguments as the DIY, D&D, and BX stuff, right? But Dogs in the Vineyard, I definitely think you do because the premise of that game is it's all about hard moral choices and you're going to go to a city and there's going to be sin. And like in terms of the way the game is supposed to be ran – as they uncover more sin, it leads to more problems, which is eventually some kind of either false church or demonic possession, right? And that is sort of the ultimate underdog, right? I'm mm-hmm. just this earthly... Well, and also at a certain point in that, you're not fighting a bad guy. You're fighting a bad idea. And right, how like do you stop an idea? How do you like stop... It's like an existential threat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. which is... Oh, well, you know, you know, one we've actually left out a bunch. Murder. That's how you stop it. <laughs> True story. The whole time. Although it's not really murder because it's justified. It's, Roland style. It's called execution. The hands did the work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but like we left out like Trail of Cthulhu, right? And yes. there is no greater underdog than than like the math professor from Miskatonic University versus Cthulhu. Yes. <laughs> you know, so... I just wonder if if it's but built into that system is the idea that you're solving challenges with the math. True, true. So it's very different. And, mm-hmm. and you're, I mean, you're using your cleverness, yeah, but it's it's kind of built in there how you're going to be solving problems. Right. It's also the the sort of the joke with Cthulhu is there's three people, three adventure, three investigators. One dies, one goes crazy, one goes missing. And that's sort of like the assumption of the trifecta of what's going to happen when you go into the game, right? And I think this should be like the GM's part of the game. Like you, you only win if you finish it in that way. <laughs> the trifecta. And everybody knows this is what you're going for. <laughs> Trying to manipulate the encounters. Oh my God, to I it. killed two of them. No, I was <laughs> right. so close. That would be kind of a fun, <laughs> fun way to go about it. You can make it a side game too. You wouldn't necessarily have to tell anybody. No. <laughs> But well, I, I think it's more fun if you do, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally – and you may not even be setting the expectations with Trail of Cthulhu and World of Darkness because they're already laid out that way. That's already the assumption you come to the table with, generally speaking, right? I feel like in World of Darkness, your decision for how you're going to solve a problem is not quite so concise. What do you mean? Like in Trail of Cthulhu, you have a point spend for so many things, and oh, these right. are the yeah, skills yeah. I have, so these are the skills I'm going to use to solve the problem. Right. It's not the same at all. No, I agree, because in, in Trail, you're sort of like setting up a mystery built a, ideally built around the skills the players have, so they have the tools to solve the problem and either go crazy, die, or go missing. But in World of Darkness, it's much more open. Is that what you're kind of... Yes. In terms of... Decisions. Right. Also, generally speaking, there is, too... The, the lack of stats creates a limitless way for me to solve problems. Right. I can't believe I'm referring to World of Darkness as a lack of stats, but... <laughs> Lots of I, dots. An infinite number of uses of right, them, right, you right, know right. what I mean? Yeah. Well, and I also think that... And maybe this is just the way we run our World of Darkness games, but, like, generally speaking, in, like, a D&D sense, right, there's a, a problem that you're going to go solve, Right. And the same could be tr- true with Trail of Cthulhu, right? There's this mystery or something that's happening. 
you know, we've got to solve the mystery. However we go about doing that, maybe we fail, maybe we summon Cthulhu, but but there's a very clear progression to go through this sort of investigation, right? Mm-hmm. And at least our World of Darkness games, they're much more open and sandboxy in that it's sort of like, what trouble do you want to make for yourself? And there's a whole world moving around you. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I feel like those are the games that you run, though. Like, World of Darkness, you could run any kind of game you I, want. You no, I totally agree. You can make an investigative agree. game. You I totally agree. A, I agree. Well, I and mean, then... And the same could be said for for D anD D. Right. Or, yeah, but, yeah. But your World of Darkness games are very sandboxy. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. Mine was a little more investigative-y. True. Or the particular one I'm thinking of, anyway. And then Orpheus is always more investigative-y. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's designed that way. Yeah. Well, I guess. And then when I refer to World of Darkness, generally speaking, I'm always referring to Vampire because that's the one we sort of our our go to and the one that we play the most. And then and the other ones, I love them just as much at least with Wraith and, and Orpheus, but they're drastically different games, I think. Like, mm-hmm. Orpheus, I would almost put it in the same category as, like, Trail of Cthulhu, maybe, you know, with that sort of uh, creepy, dark, investigative, don't have enough information, big bad kind of a thing, and you're underpowered. Well, I thought that was one of the few games I ran that did not have a foregone conclusion, but... I I had been on the doing combat with Spectre's end of the thing as mm-hmm. a player, but as a storyteller, I had never ran them before. So I honestly had no like I could have I could have created a smog for you guys to fight. I I had no clue. <laughs> like, is this going to come out like a goblin battle, or is it going <laughs> to come out like smog? I I don't know. Not a clue. And so then I felt like. Like the scenario with the Lost Boys. So I, I there were like six of them mm-hmm. or something. And, and I was, I thought that that would be quite difficult because I had considered like, you know, maybe like just four. But and I was like, no, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it tough. Six. I would like to, I would like to maybe kill somebody with this encounter. Not even close. So. Not even close. No, I agree. So <laughs> to give some context to this, Orpheus and Wraith both. It's really hard to kill somebody. Yes. Because <laughs> you have um, a resource called vitality, and it also counts as your health levels, but it also fuels your powers. And then you can replenish it uh, with willpower, and you can also share vitality among the party, basically, Which right? Which the specters can't do, and I don't think I appreciated enough mm-hmm. how impactful that is. <laughs> right. So the problem I feel like with Orpheus was like, like in that Lost Boy encounter. So Lost Boys are like these sort of like childlike specters that are going to chase you around and eat you basically, right? Like and there's lots the of them. Yeah, 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 basically. Yeah. And so the the problem I had with Orpheus was like a lot of games sort of scale in difficulty, right? And, and like the, the difficulty curve is sort of like a 45 degree line. But Orpheus, I never felt like it was that way. It was like a stair step. And as it went on the stairs keep getting steeper and taller and steeper and taller until there's just no way you're going to survive this at all. You know, and that's one of the problems that I always kind of had with it because it's really easy to push it over the edge. But then again, you can come back as a ghost and I don't know, kind of kind of getting off all, a little bit all over the place. But that's actually a really good example of one that is um, insurmountable odds. That is, I think, one of the best RPG stories that's out there. And I guess the... Without, I don't want to give anything away because, I, like I say, if you ever have a chance to get into Orpheus or play through it, it's definitely worth worth doing. But there's sort of like a series of events that are happening in the Orpheus world, right? In the ghost world or whatever. And it's really more about how do your characters plug into that and what do they do? So this is exactly the same thing we were talking about before with the insurmountable odds, right? You're you're against this 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 evil or this force that you like is so much bigger than you. And yet there's still a way to run around inside this world and connect to things and do things and sort of have an impact on it. But the sort of the events of the world are still going to keep turning. I, I see a lot of parallels between it and Trail of Cthulhu with the kind of slow burn yeah. trouble that you get into. Because with Trail of Cthulhu, once you start tapping your skill points, mm-hmm. then they're dwindling down and you're like, oh, I don't have time to to – to, to rest or recuperate, but mm-hmm. if I don't, I'm going to be useless. And you get the same sort of thing with Orpheus because you start tapping down the number of, you know, you start accumulating yeah, spite, t- and... tapping down your vitality, and then you're like, 
I, I can't leave this encounter. Like something bad is going to happen. Some terror is going to be happening and I'm the only one that can stop it. But if I don't rest, then I'm going to, to mm -hmm. burn out. Well, it's, it's got so that it's, sort of like, like a death constant, spiral thing. Yeah, it's a constant time crunch. There's right. like this extra very real time aspect that you don't get with a lot of other RPGs. Kind of creates that because it's a it's a it, this tighter spiral well, as you go. You yeah, know? it's interesting because like we've talked about several different games, right? And so in the fantasy version, like in this Hot Springs thing, it seemed like the key was just an overabundance of encounters that you could stumble into, right? There was always something to do that was da one dangerous and made you sort of deal with it, hopefully in a non-combat kind of way. How do, how do I resolve this situation, whether that was through retreating or negotiation or whatever, right? So that one is a wealth of encounters, right? Mm -hmm. What was the other ones we talked about? So World of Darkness, what ma or and specifically Vampire, right? What makes it work? is the fact that there's a whole world of trouble to get into. I get which is sort of like a wealth of encounters, but like they're not pre-planned necessarily, at least in in my case. It's sort of like the world is reacting to what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is what has made those games successful in in that sense, which is and all of these ideas I think are easily portable to other stuff, right? And then Trail of Cthulhu, what has what makes it turn and sort of work is that while there's insurmountable odds, the sort of the world and the investigation ideally should be structured around what your characters are good at. Or if it's around something that they're they're not good at, then that's the feature of what, what the adventure is about, right? So like if you have the mathematician and the linguist and the physicist, then you know that those are all going to be important pieces of, of the investigation ideally, right? Yeah. What? I always picture getting to the end and be like, why didn't we choose geologist? Oh, God. <laughs> this is the one puzzle we can't <laughs> solve without him. And then <laughs> in the case of Orpheus, there's this larger world turning on and it's winding down in this death spiral kind of end. And then it's how do you interface with that and how do you want to try to affect that? I don't know. It's like four very different ways to approach it but all still doing the same thing where the characters are against insurmountable odds. And in all of those games, I've never, I'm kinda, I've never played in a hot springs game. Right. But I have played in fantasy games that are, you know, sort of in that, that style or whatever, but I never felt railroaded in any of those. And I never felt like, Oh, we're never going to be able to beat Sauron. Why are we playing this game? It was more like, okay, cool. We definitely can't beat Sauron, so let's go take on some of his underlings and weaken him until we can find some way to really get at him. Do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so I do have one other kind of question is that you talked about so a lot of the games that you run have this sort of foregone conclusion to them, right? So games like Dread and Bluebeard and... That's it. Those are the only games I ever run. <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of ones that specifically have a like a foregone conclusion to them. I don't know. What did you think about Bedlam Hall? Does this fit in this conversation? I ran that game. It wasn't that long ago. There was a weird bird creature. No, I don't feel like this fits in. <laughs> I don't even know. Was it? I was just trying to have a good time. <laughs> well, like, I guess it's insurmountable in the fact that you're never going to satisfy the family. But that's part of the premise of the of the game. <laughs> but yeah. like, it's fun. In the case of Dread and Bluebeard, right? It's a those are both one very dark uh, and also we all know the outcome, right, is not going to be good. And I don't know, is it, like, I never felt railroaded by those games, but I felt like it was maybe because we're playing to sort of, like, to steal a term from Apocalypse World to see what happens, right? Like, we're playing for an experience as opposed to playing for an end. It's, like, it's more about, like, the middle as opposed to the ending, because we already all know that, right? Right. So does that, like, shade how you... Like, conceptually, I understand Bluebeard, but I, I could never imagine. Like, when I sat down and played it, I realized, oh, this is not a game for me <laughs> to run. Right? I love it. It's really cool. But it's not not for me at all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you've ran lots of other other games, similar ones we talked about, right? Like Orpheus and, and Vampire and, and Trail of Cthulhu. I don't, I don't think you've ever actually ran a trail. But, but like – I'm not. No, but have you <laughs> – when you put those games together, were they sort of – did you put them together similar to the the other ones? Does it make sense? No. No. <laughs> so, well, I didn't – I assume not because they're so different. Well, Dread is kind of different because we sort of have the ending in mind and the theme. 
And then a lot of it is like things that hit the theme button. Right. So like for the haunted house one, right. It was just trying to come up with scenes for each character. Right. Uh Um, to see what you guys would do. And then making sure I hit the appropriate haunted house horror buttons Mm -hmm. during (laughs) during play and just sort of seeing how it would end. And I read, ran that one a couple of different times. The second time I ran it, it was at this shop and I sort of decided because one player died early on that I would let them live in the house as a ghost. And then Mm -hmm. it became a little bit more sort of slapstick humor as they interacted with the rest of the party, which was fine. Um, It was just a different feel for things. Is that the one I played in? I think so. Yeah. yeah. That was a good time. That was a good game. I actually think you played in both of them. I played the one. Yeah. And then I did kind of a spur of the moment. Well, it wasn't really. I did some. I guess that's how I run most of my games. Disregard. I did some planning and then made up the rest uh, at the last minute. And that was the one I did for you and Jordan and Isaiah on the sci fi ship. And so. Oh, yeah. 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 um, Actually, with that one, I was like. Well, I've ran Dread a couple of times, and it's kind of fun when I kill you guys, but I wonder if I could design it to where you would kill each other and I wouldn't have to do anything. <laughs> so then all of my plot points were just sowing seeds of doubt between the people in the mix. You know what? You should put that one together. <laughs> like, I don't know how you would put that one together because it was, I could tell it was largely improvised or whatever, you know, because it was... Mm. A lot of the stuff that was happening was dictated by what we were doing. My science terminology would be a lot better if I planned it out instead of spur of the moment. <laughs> but like... <laughs> like, uh, yes, I, you find waves of seismic... Cor- combustion. Corkeology <laughs> <But activity. like, laughs> I felt like that was probably the strongest Dread game you ran. It was fun. <laughs> and I don't know if that was because it was more sort of like player versus player or whatever. Because there was like... I think so. Because, well, I, I read that part like in the book where it says combat is a terrible idea because basically it, it, it's like two pulls for every action yeah. instead of one. So now I was like, how can I can, how can I coerce you guys <laughs> Well, and it really to wasn't kill us each other? fighting each other per se? It yes, was... it was. I don't think at the beginning we were like trying to like. Oh, not at the beginning. Like, that, the beginning was the sowing the seeds of doubt. Right. We were like trying to like lock each other in this module or whatever. Right. You're like, you know, and vent then, to space. Then it escalated. You know? Yeah. As, as to things, physical combat. <laughs> as things often do. And then it was great because you guys were just going to keep doing it. And one of you was definitely going to die. And I didn't have to do anything at all. Right. Just let it happen. Anyway, that's completely not related to what we're talking about well, at no, all. No, I'm just wondering because I think you're hitting on a lot on the improvisation part of this. And I wonder how much of that doesn't play into this because that is that is largely my style. I jot down a couple notes and well, a couple high points. The reason that that worked was because of character design. Mm-hmm. And you can't really – so you can do that in a game that you run at your home, but you would have to have people make characters first first right and then use that to plan out your plot to a certain right. degree so to have like a really solid so, session yeah. zero it works really well for con games right. because you're making all the characters mm-hmm. so I, I think that's part of the reason why the pip system game i ran was so fun at the mall because i got to do all the pre-gen so then mm-hmm. i kind of <laughs> we get to like front load all the drama and everything else yeah although giving them a secret was just a spur of the moment idea that i thought worked really well well so do you think that same logic applies in sort of like PBTA games because you have the playbooks, which are, you know, my, if I make a gun lugger and you make a gun lugger, they could be drastically different, right? But functionally, story wise, how they're they kind of work. They're not different. Well, no, but that's what I'm saying is like they, they're, they're, their tropes are going to be the same. So you can lean on those characters in a similar kind of a way. So while you're still largely improvising the game, it has these conflicts that are sort of built into it because of the way certain tropes are are put together, right? Mm-hmm. And Bluebeard being a great example of this, you just have the the those five choices of the sort of like versions of the feminine archetype or whatever, right? And that drastically flavors how it how that game goes. Plus that everybody leans into those tropes and they play that game. Yeah. I, I, at least I feel like they. Well, it works really well in Bedlam Hall. As well, because you know that the types of characters are going to be present because it's an apocalypse world game. So there's playbooks, but they also inherently come with a secret. Mm-hmm. And and then you can kind of muck about oh, with those, right. you know, in a longer term game. Right. That's what would make that interesting is the secret mechanic. Just makes me wonder because, like, I'm thinking of Night Witches now and how that game is nearly entirely improvised. 
And there have been a few moments where I thought, oh, this would be a really cool thing to have happen. Right. So then it was like improvising the game to steer it towards a scene if I could. And there have been some things that I thought would be cool to have happen, but didn't because the game just didn't go that way. And I didn't, you know, like you don't want to force it, obviously. And so I just I don't know. I feel like this is one of those ones where it's like I I wonder if it's not your style, like, you know, yours and mine being largely improvisational. Right. And sort of like just reacting to what the players do make this struggle fun as opposed to feeling just oppressive when you're struggling against something larger that you're that's sort of insurmountable. Do you know what I'm saying? Because if you're much, much more structured in the way you run the game, I could see how that would be no fun because, you know, if you're progressing from point one to two to three to four to five and there's no hope of defeating the bad guy, I could I could see how that could come across as being frustrating and boring. Does it make sense? Mm-hmm. Well, and... I've ran some games before where the the plot was a little more set to begin with. And as a GM, that makes me a lot more comfortable and a lot less feeling like I'm going to vomit before I run the game. (laughs) But the games tend to not be as good (laughs) because it it does feel a little forced. Give me me an example. What do you you mean? Um, So like when I ran Tales from the Loop, right? Uh I liked that game, but... It felt a little forced where we ended up, like, at the junkyard. And I don't know if that's just, like, I didn't... It didn't seem like it was going At the shop or at our table? At the shop. Okay. It didn't seem like it was going to, like, naturally flow in that direction, but Mm. I really wanted it to. And so I kind of made it (laughs) go that direction a little bit. Well, you can find and feed them breadcrumbs to be like, oh, you need to go here. Or the old man at the junkyard knows about the radio waves or whatever because he's a Vietnam vet or, you know, like, however you want to do that or whatever, you know. And I don't... I see what you're saying, but I, I feel like if you're used to sort of like molding the situation to what you need. Mm-hmm. I'm not mi- saying it was bad. I'm yeah. just saying that's the example I can think of right. that like. Well, what I was saying is that I feel like sometimes you can feel like maybe it's more you're being more forceful than you normally would mm-hmm. because, you know, maybe the normal progression is for you to sort of like gently nudge like like bumpers on a, at a bowling alley. You're like, boing, boing, you know, and steering it always towards the pins, right? But sometimes you have to, you know, be a little more strong in your guidance to get get things or whatever. And then when you do those, have those moments, it, you, there's a very definite difference in, in the feel or whatever to it, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. I don't know. I don't know, it's just interesting because I, I really have a hard time imagining – running a game where I really planned every moment of it out. Do you know what I mean? I can remember a time when uh, we had a World of Darkness game that was, uh, you were three siblings. You, Carrie, and Lee were three siblings, and you were each three different supernaturals, (laughs) right? But I remember making decision treats for what you guys were going to do because, generally speaking, when you're presented an option, there's kind of like two ways it goes, right? And I may not say how you're going to get to yes or how you're going to get to no, but either the choice is either going to be yes or no, right? And then sort of like having this huge decision tree that went off of it on down. Mm -hmm. And while I wouldn't say I planned that game from beginning to end, I did plan like here's how people react to your decisions down the way. I don't know. It's just a weird – something I've never done before. I don't don't know that's entirely at all relevant to any of this, but it just – it was just spinning up in my head and, you know, (laughs) made me consider. I don't know. I like the idea of the decision tree. We should revisit this at some point. <laughs> I don't know. Because sometimes you spend a lot of time and like there's a whole half of a tree you're just not going to use because you go this way. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're like, well, I that was a lot of thinking for nothing. So I don't know for whatever that's worth. <laughs> but... All right. Well, uh, I think we'll wrap this one up here. I'm not entirely sure that uh... – I mean, I think we hit on the topic initially a little bit, but I, I don't know. Just an interesting thought process, and I was just kind of curious to see, um, kind of like walk this through and how, uh, at least at our table, I've felt like the games where we've set this sort of as the parameters of the game, they've gone well, and there's been no complaints of like, I feel like there's no choices or whatever, and what it was about our table specifically or what we were doing is game masters or players that made it work, I guess. So hopefully you guys can get something useful out of this. I don't know. If not, uh, I don't know. (laughs) Well, I think that'll do it for us this week. Hopefully you guys get something useful out of this. I'm not sure. Just one of those weird things where we've had great success at our table with sort of these um, terrible situations that players get put in. 
and these sort of insurmountable odds and how that all kind of comes together. We weren't sure if, whether that was just our style of running games or the people that we have around our table. But we've had success doing similar games at uh, conventions and, and at our indie RPG days. So it was just kind of interesting to sort of talk through it and see how it kind of went. I don't know. I wasn't really sure what we were going to get out of this, but uh, hopefully... Uh, you guys will find something useful from it and uh, maybe encourage you to be a little more improvisational in your own uh, – in the games that you run at your own table. So as you guys know, we're a member of the Gunna Geek Network, and there's tons and tons of great shows that you can check out at GunnaGeekNetwork.com, like On the Bubble Podcast, All Things Good and Nerdy, The Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., Starling Tribune, Game Life Balance U.S. and Game Life Balance Australia. There's lots of awesome ge- geeky content that you can find at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And if you are a podcaster, you can find loads of great advice from technical stuff to uh, equipment reviews and all kinds of stuff on better podcasting. If you like what we do here at Just More Fix, you can support us at Patreon and get access to all of our pre-shows and raw, unedited episodes. And you can get access to the PDF of our quarterly zines and print copies if you support at the appropriate level. So you should all go out and be awesome like Treza, Tiziana Furlano, Alistair H., Simon McNair, Alan White, and the OG Todd Olson. I think that'll do it for us this week, and we will see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. This has been an episode of Just One More Fix. Music has been provided by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at incompetech.com. You can support us at patreon.com slash justonemorefix, or follow us on Twitter at justonemorefix. 